Welcome to the Trainers Bullpen, where trainers in the law enforcement space come to hear the experts talk about their work, their experience, and research into human performance, particularly as it relates to the critical aspects of training motor learning and adaptive decision making. The purpose of the Trainers Bullpen is to help bridge the gap between law enforcement training and the findings of academic research and current pedagogical best practice. Our desire at the Trainers Bullpen is to help advance law enforcement training, make research applied, and improve officer and public safety. The Trainers Bullpen is a production of Raptor Protection, and I'm Chris Butler, your host. And today, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show, Sean Mishka. Sean holds a Master of Science in Exercise Science from California University of Pennsylvania. He served primarily as a personal performance advisor and movement skill acquisition coach for National Football League players since 2008 working with approximately 12 players each year and has partnered with five NFL All-Pro selections and 12 NFL Pro Bowl team members. Sean is the founder and host of the Sport Movement Skill Conference, which is organized in an attempt to change the lens through which professionals view sport movement. He operates a football-specific movement blog, Football Beyond the Stats, in which he uniquely breaks down the movement skills of top performers in the sport. Sean is a frequent guest for various podcasts within the athletic performance space, typically discussing conceptual ideas that per pertain to the art of being a more effective movement coach, and he has presented over two dozen times at major strength coach and sport coach conferences nationwide since 2006. Sean has developed content for the educational brand Movement Mastery from 2014 till the formation of Emergence with the sole purpose of helping to enable a deeper understanding of the processes involved in the acquisition of more masterful movement for athletes in sport. And Sean is the co-author of Applying an Ecological Approach to Practice Design in American Football and co-author of Being Water, how key ideas from the practice of Bruce Lee align with contemporary theorizing in movement skill acquisition. And that study was recently published in the Journal of Sport Education and Society. Sean Mishka, welcome to the Trainers Bullpen, bullpen my friend. Uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me. I could not be more excited to be here. I love the little introduction that you gave to the Trainers Bullpen. And your purpose, your vision for what the, the bullpen is going to be, what this podcast is really going to offer for not only the law enforcement community, but really, I think, everyone's view of the world. Uh, the part that really struck me and resonated with me is obviously you brought up adaptive decision making in there. And I hope that that's a topic we're going to be able to pull some threads upon. And I think we probably will. I agree. I think we will, too. And and Sean, just for our listeners, I want to let them in on a little insight about you because I sent to you what I do with all of my my uh, uh, people who are going to come on the podcast who I interview. I typically will do a, a rough outline and I send it to them ahead of time. And, and typically they will usually appreciate getting that. But you emailed me back right away and said, thanks for that. I'm not even going to look at it. And so that really struck me because it also goes directly to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today. So can can you tell our listeners, like, why, why would you not want the questions ahead of time to a podcast that you're going on? Yeah, I, and I love the question. And I've been doing this probably since 2016, 2017, somewhere in that vicinity. Anytime that I interact with a podcast and a podcast host or guest, I try to do the same thing when I'm going into, say, a presentation or a seminar that I might deliver. I want to be so present and so immersed in this mutual reciprocal relationship that is the what is, what is here, what is in front of me and what is in front of you and how does this mutual reciprocal exchange unfold organically, unfold uh, in a really authentic way. And it's only going to happen this way once, right? So I don't want to have any preconceived notion as to maybe what you're going to ask or what you want to pull upon. I would rather interact with that what is, as Bruce Lee would say, the aliveness of that problem. And I believe that that's actually what an ecological dynamics rationale and adopting it in one's life 
really truly entails. I, I want to embody and embrace this as a worldview, as my way of life, as my form of life, as opposed to just some way to look at movement behavior on a football field, in my case, or in a law enforcement environment in yours. Right. And I think that's very insightful, Sean. That's why I wanted to to even introduce uh, that point, because it's when you talk about interacting in an alive way with your environment, this is something every single call that a law enforcement officer goes to, it's novel, it's unique, they don't know what to expect. And so their ability to, to do sense making very quickly to interact with that environment in a very dynamic way and, and, and have that ability to do adaptive decision making is at the very heart of excellent policing performance. So mm -hmm. I'm super excited about this conversation because we're I think we're going to hit all these issues. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I would start the listeners off with another idea that Bruce Lee usually cap captures. Uh, he's obviously taking it and paraphrasing it, but we never stand in the same river twice for we're not the same man and the river isn't the same either. And I think that encompasses movement on a football field or skill and skill execution on a football field or on a police call. So we're going to see that we have way more similarities than dissimilarities for sure. Absolutely. And Sean, you mentioned something when, when you were just speaking, you used the phrase ecological dynamics framework. And mm -hmm. now this is something, uh, and I mentioned in our, just our discussion before the podcast started is typically law enforcement training in North America, at least Europe's a little bit different. Um, they, there has been probably much more of a pull into the ecological dynamics mm -hmm. constraint led approach in Europe but it is slowly starting. We're seeing uh, like one degree of separation begin to happen in North America as well. But for the benefit of our listeners, Sean, could you maybe give us a brief ecological dynamics for dummies? Um, like, you know what the traditional view is, and I think it's the traditional approach and still in, in the majority of sporting, but maybe can you put both of those in a nutshell and so we can understand the difference? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And I love the question here because this gives us a, a point of departure, a point of departure from that, which what has traditionally been thought of or done, right? Like where in traditional, uh, let's just call it maybe dogmatic ways of thinking, the, it's more linear in its approach. It's more linear to where we are trying to beat a path maybe within the brain or within the body that is stored within the organism themselves that they will then be able to recall and then automatize certain movement actions when the situation or scenario might call for it. But oftentimes that work that's being done traditionally is done in a rote fashion, rote meaning rep after rep after rep, thinking that they're just going to um, get this perfect practice that is then going to make perfect. And I'm sure it's said around police academies, just as it is in the sporting world here in America, uh, or really across the world for that matter. But where ecological dynamics in its, in its framework really starts to kind of point or its lens is on this performer environment relationship, this mutual reciprocal exchange between a performer. It doesn't matter if it's a American football player or running back facing a, you know, coming to the line of scrimmage and trying to make somebody miss, or if it's a police officer going on a call that is going to differ in levels of complexity and chaos and unpredictability. What we find, again, is the aliveness of this. And what we will do here is focus our point of analysis or our scope of analysis on this relationship. And if we do that, when we analyze or attempt to uh, really try to understand this relationship and its nuances, it leaves us to a place where our skill acquisition methodologies are going to change significantly. Obviously, what we find there, if it's this mutual reciprocal exchange between, say, a police officer in all the chaos of their environment, of that call and everything it entails, there's just going to be this constant intertwined, interwoven nature between the two of them. They are going to be in this constant changing state of organization if we want to think about it like that. 
That is, I act in the world, the world around me changes. And as the world around me changes, it feeds right into the way that I might perceive or intend or make decisions or then ultimately act upon it with differing levels of functionality or practicality or usefulness, right? Like things can go really astray really quickly if we are going to think that things are just going to automatically run on their own because we've beaten some sort of path in a repetition type of way. So where we find with ecological dynamics and the true practical applicable use here is we find repetition without repetition, where no two problems are ever the same and neither are any two solutions. We find nonlinearity as opposed to linearity. We know that on different days, performers are going to be different. And on different days, the environment is going to call for different opportunities. It's going to have emerging and decaying opportunities to act that are going to differ situation by situation. And of course, ecological dynamics then just becomes much more about representativeness. How do we represent that relationship between performer and environment or between police officer and, and their really chaotic environment. I mean, no one has it more chaotic than your crew does, right? And those, when we talk about a live movement problems and really, you know, this, I owe a, a huge uh, homage here to Bruce Lee in this idea, right? This aliveness starts to take center stage in our learning environments. Because if you're environment, your learning environment isn't all that alive, it isn't going to present the same types of challenges or opportunities, or in your world, potentially threats, maybe life-threatening ones, to the point where we don't understand how we must relate to the world. And, and so hopefully, I, I probably got a little long-winded there and, and took us on a tangent, but it it just becomes that much more logical for the way that humans interact with the world as opposed to this more traditionally thought of more linearly based um, method towards skill acquisition where we are, are going to try to acquire something through constant perfect execution, which we know in the real world just doesn't happen. Right. Absolutely. And the other thing with, with law enforcement, I'm sure that this is the same in, in the world of sports skill acquisition is police officers will like one the, the, I always say the most important skill for a police officer is reading. That is sense making it's game intelligence. It's not even the practical physical skills that you bring to that. It's the wisdom of skill application. And that mm -hmm. only occurs through sense making. And I, I'm interested, like, do you think then, like, if you're heavily entrenched, you come out of a culture, let's say a police academy of, of six months, 26, 28 weeks or more of a very linear, uncoupled type of training, and I mean, uncoupled from the environment, mm -hmm. so it lacks contextualization, should we then be surprised that police officers struggle with rapid sense making and that adaptive decision making? Or, or is there like a predictive relationship? No, I mean, I think you hit the nail right on the head here. I've noticed the same thing in the National Football League with the players that I partner with versus maybe their counterparts who are training in cone drills or rote rehearsal or unopposed type of repetitions versus my guys, the guys that I partner in lock arms with, uh, obviously, they are so immersed in these types of environments that they are just so willing to thrive in that discomfort. And of course, again, uh, calling the elephant in the room here is that the police officer, when they get out of the academy and they go out into the real world, the whole world is going to bring discomforts and obstacles and challenges and things that might not have been represented as well when it was decoupled. You know, I mean, they know that Everybody has the best of intentions. No one wants the police officer going out into the field to not be equipped and armed with the ability to make sense, as you would put it, you know, to make decisions on the fly in an emergent and online fashion. However, we have to try to find ways of injecting that in our learning environment, making people much more comfortable in that discomfort. And of course, that's like a cliche thing that people say. Well, that person is comfortable being uncomfortable. 
but they didn't just inherit that in most cases they developed it they acquired that they acquired their skill through that or on, in alongside of that and i i've found that in the sports skill world that if somebody has done a lot of decontextualized work it's decoupled it's cone drills ladder drills it's unopposed type of repetitions it's striking a dummy it's striking a ball off of a pitching machine and the like i mean there's so many examples that then would obviously have a, an analogy to the police training world that then they need some time to be able to get reconnected in the couple of their movements in relation to that information that is actually going to regulate their actions the late and great J.J. Gibson, ecological psychologist, said behavior affords behavior. So the behavior of what else is out there in the world, what else is unfolding out there, is going to determine my opportunities to act in given ways. And of course, no place is that showcased more than in a police environment. Right. Absolutely. So let's, uh, you, you've mentioned Bruce Lee's name a couple of times now. So I'm super excited. I love this paper, by the way, oh, thank my, you. my background is, uh, is in martial arts. And when I was growing up, I was a massive Bruce Lee fan. And so when your paper came out, I, I said, what's this a research <laughs> paper on Bruce Lee. So you and uh, Tyler Yerby and Keith Davids published this paper in Sport Education and Society, and the title is Being Water, How Key Ideas from the Practice of Bruce Lee Align with the Contemporary Theorizing in Movement Skill Acquisition. So that's quite a title, but what, but what I, I always like when I, when I talk to somebody who's published a research paper is I want to find out like what, what made you, what motivated you and your colleagues to go like, well, why Bruce Lee? So what was it about Bruce Lee that spoke to you and caused you to dive in on this? Yeah, a really great question. And uh, I will try to condense my answer and make it succinct because I could probably take up the rest of our time together just speaking to the influence that Bruce Lee has had on my craft. And that really was the impetus for why it is that we did this between myself and Tyler Yerby, my, uh, my counterpart at Emergence, uh, my co-director of education also alongside of me at Emergence. He and I were speaking about Bruce Lee's influence on our lives. And we had just written, uh, so we were coming on the tail end of the Applying an Ecological Approach in American Football paper that came out in 2022. And we're always looking for new challenges to wrestle with. And Tyler brought it up to me. He said, you know, we both have been influenced so much by Bruce Lee and particularly the way he reconceptualized the martial arts or interpret it personally in Jeet Kune Do. Um, and, and his influence on me and my craft was actually much deeper than say those that maybe have come as our forefathers in ecological dynamics. Nikolai Bernstein, J.J. Gibson, Carl Newell, Keith Davids, who you mentioned, who was actually then, uh, we were fortunate and blessed to have him on the paper. These individuals who showed me the way from an ecological dynamics rationale actually were preceded by Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was my introduction into bringing more aliveness, into investigating others technique and then allowing the players that I was partnering with to adjust and adapt their technique themselves authentically to that situation. And so it was one of those things where I wanted to kind of pay homage to his influence, certainly, but I really wanted to pull back the layers on maybe the, the origins of some of his ideas and to show us that he was living and breathing by an ecological dynamics framework long before others were even speaking about framing our scope of analysis on a performer environment relationship. Bruce Lee was doing it before everyone else was in that way. Now, certainly there have been others uh, prior to Bruce Lee and, and in between there that have encompass that as well, embodied that as well. But you mentioned, obviously, if you've had any history and past in martial arts, people know what kind of influence Bruce Lee had on the martial arts community as a whole, as opposed to chasing forms and katas and rote ways of behaving where styles and became the dogmatic way of doing things. 
that one person and their model was the thing we would aspire to. Bruce Lee started saying things that really resonated to me, such as to honestly and authentically express oneself, to use no way as the way, to be water and to try to find ways to either flow or crash in this sort of yin yang type of relationship that we all should embody the essence of when we interact with the world. And so these things really started to speak to me before I even stumbled upon an ecological dynamics framework. And that's why we wanted to uh, kind of put together this really unique piece alongside of, of Keith, of course. And, uh, it just ended up being a really cool piece, probably, you know, my favorite thing that I've ever been a part of. Uh, and I've been a part of some pretty cool things that I, that I'm really happy and, and proud and grateful of, but this Bruce Lee paper, just because I think we were able to capture who he is, what his skill was about and how he taught or approached not only martial arts, but life. Uh, I think we did a pretty good job of doing that. And, and I'm very happy and proud of, of that. Yeah, I would agree. I think you did a fantastic job of capturing that in, in the paper. And one of the things that I once heard Bruce uh, Lee say, I, I read this, that he said this to one of his students. He said, I'm not teaching you anything. I'm helping mm -hmm. you learn to explore yourself. And I found that was a remarkably profound statement because th doesn't that really capture his whole philosophy about life? Like you said, we're, you know, we can look at it in sports skill movement acquisition, which it certainly is, but much more broader than that. It's a whole approach on how you, you see yourself in this world and how you mm -hmm. approach life, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, that's why we actually use the title of being water too, and, and becoming more water like obviously at the heart of water is this adaptive nature and this ability to, to move and flow and find one's way through whatever the environment asks of us. You know, as Bruce Lee say, said, water can flow or it can crash. Water becomes the bottle, it becomes the cup, it becomes the teapot. It flows into and around or through, depending on where those opportunities may exist and lie, right? And our existence in interaction with the what is again. What is really there and how are we aiming to interact with it at that time is going to be about this mutuality, this reciprocal nature between us and the world. And I think Bruce Lee did that as much as anyone else really has, at least embodying that at a time when others really weren't um, maybe going down that similar path, certainly in martial arts. But even in, uh, obviously, the filmmaking that he did and, and the way that he acted within it, um, his injection in of philosophy into martial arts was something that often took center stage. And that's why he talked in many of these metaphors, such as being water and, and uh, you know, being a, a teacher isn't about teaching, it's about being a guide, a facilitator, helping one explore themselves and express themselves. These are things that I think all of us could learn from. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. And I think at the heart of that, I as I've studied the ecological dynamics, and I'm I'm an, uh, a self confessed infant when it comes <laughs> to ecological dynamics, but I am I'm fascinated by this whole approach because. I, I have personally repented from the linear traditional uh, method of bless you, bless teaching, you. <laughs> motor, teaching motor skills. And uh, the more I learn about the ecological dynamics, I am convinced that this is the direction that law enforcement training needs to go, Sean. But, mm -hmm. but at the heart of it, and and, and it, as Bruce Lee said, I'm, I'm, I'm helping you learn to learn about yourself is this idea of self-organization that mm -hmm. isn't, is that is at the heart of the ecological dynamics framework. So can you maybe explain like, what do we mean or what, what is meant when someone says self-organization in the ecological dynamics world? Yeah. And, and the one thing that it doesn't mean is just leaving things to chance which is sometimes misconstrued or misunderstood, right? Especially because of the way that the term is coined, self-organized. Like we just think ourselves are the things that are gonna go organize our actions or movement behaviors within the world. And when I say movement behavior, 
we almost have to reframe and reconceptualize movement behavior as a whole from this perspective, right? The movement behavior that takes place anywhere in the world is about this emergent interaction with the world and its problems, where then the performer or the police officer or the running back or the artist or whoever it might be is going to coordinate, control, and organize their perceptions their cognitions and their actions in this close intertwined interwoven way in connection or coupling to the problems of the world. And this self-organization is really about how those component parts and these processes and these elements kind of flow into one another, come together, come to be to coordinate our behaviors in the world. And so it isn't, again, leaving it to chance per se, but it's giving the individual the opportunity to organize or to regulate some of those processes in, in the way that they come to be or come together. Ironically enough, Nikolai Bernstein, also of ecological dynamics fame, back before he died in 67, talked about this with repetition without repetition. Again, no two problems are the same, neither are any two solutions. So this solution process is really about how a performer is adjusting the relations between what they're perceiving, the information they detect out in the world and its opportunities or its challenge. And, and it flows seamlessly right into the cognitions and the intentions and the decision-making. And it flows seamlessly then into the way one acts. So even though, and when I say the way one acts, the way that they would act from a motor system degrees of freedom, the way that uh, the bones, joints, limbs, muscles come together to allow us to carry out something. And it may sound as though I'm taking it in a linear process. However, I'm not. Notice the way that I said it's seamlessly or it's intertwined, it's entangled. So we can't separate those things from one another, those processes. It's not perception, then cognition, then action in maybe the traditional, say the OODA loop or something of the sort, right? It's them all being coupled closely together. That's really what the self-organization process is about, that you can't separate them from one another. It's like J.J. Gibson, I mentioned him earlier, ecological psychologist, late ecological psychologist said, we perceive to act and we act to perceive. So the two, it's this constant intertwined interwoven nature here as well. And that becomes framed by our intentionality and our decision-making. So we become open and responsive to the rich landscape of opportunities in the world. And so self-organization is really this, this process that is inherent in all systems. It isn't just movement systems. It's not just in a human. We can investigate self-organization anywhere and everywhere in the real world. Uh, we could do it in the stock market and flocks of birds or fish, uh, the, the way that they come together. These types of things, these types of systems can be investigated at that level and see how adjustments are made in and across each one of the degrees of freedom, we'll call them. Right. And I'm, I'm interested that you uh, spoke about Boyd's OODA loop because Colonel Boyd, I mean, I think this is something we often will hear law enforcement trainers will kind of parrot, you know, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. Mm -hmm. And But if you actually really read Boyd, and this is what made that framework so effective, is his that construct was embedded in a rich ecological framework. Like he, he stressed that your action is always changing your environment. And therefore, like it, like you said, you can't uncouple mm -hmm. the observe, orient, decide and act. It is a completely alive ecological framework. And, um, and so I think that that's a helpful way also to kind of think about for law enforcement officers that you, how you interact with your environment, whether that's the, the individuals in your environment or just ecologically your world, everything you do changes your environment and requires constant adaptation. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think too often what has happened because of the construct is people misconstrue it, right? They think that you can train those processes 
separately from one another. You observe, then you orient, then you decide, then you act. And they think that they can do them in decontextualized ways, right? Like we're just going to work on the actions today. How am I shooting at the range? But how you shoot at the range probably doesn't fit very closely to how you shoot if you have to do it in a live field environment. Because now what you're observing and how you're orienting yourself and when and where and why and how you decide to act is going to shape how you act. So to separate them from one another is to decouple them, as you mentioned earlier. And what we have found over and over again is that's not a very effective way of maybe composing functional behavior because people don't often, uh, you know, they, they forget that it all is about that sense making in the world. It's about our detection of information in the world. You mentioned the word reading earlier, which is a concept from martial arts that I quite love. Uh, obviously, if you followed me or anyone who has uh, knows how much I'm um, really like, I, I love watching Israel Adesanya, the last style bender, who's the current middleweight champion in the world. And he often talks about downloading information of his opponent. And we see him acting in this very ecological way. He's acting to perceive, perceiving to act at all times. And his actions then are almost always closely connected and coupled to these opportunities that he then detected or he read, he picked up or he made sense about. But notice all of those things are very entangled and interwoven and, and it's all about this immersion with its problems um, or the, the human's problems in the environment. Great. And so for our law enforcement trainers who are starting to hear about ecological dynamics, Sean, one of the first criticisms I hear about that, and you kind of touched on this already a little bit, is that this whole idea of it's just hands off and let go and anything goes and, you know, so whether we think of like a draw stroke with a firearm or ground fighting, escaping from a guard or a mount on the ground, if someone takes you to the ground, there certainly are biomechanical efficiencies and better ways of moving to optimize power and, and speed and efficiency of motor movement. So how can you help trainers understand? So if it's self-organization, then what does the feedback model look like of how do I give feedback if I can see that there's better ways biomechanically mm -hmm. and more efficiencies that the learners could be using? How, how do we approach giving feedback? Yeah, I think first we have to think about how context shapes the content. And what I mean by that is what the problem entails or asks or invites of the individual. And allowing them to experience it and become immersed inside and alongside of it. I talk about becoming one with the problem, finding one's functional fit with the problem. And there, I believe it should be this authentic and adaptable fit, certainly. And it's going to be dependent on the context and its situation. Now, I, I say all that to say this, much to the point that you're making here is that we need them to experience it first and foremost, right? And if uh, they aren't experiencing it, what is then going to happen is that they might not understand the opportunities right off the bat. I talked to somebody just a couple of days ago uh, who was kind of on a, a early journey in parkour. And I actually advised the individual, uh, myself alongside of Tyler, uh, we were on a call with this person, and we actually did advise them to go out and seek how other people may have interacted with similar behaving problems. But again, let's remember no two problems are the same, so neither are any two solutions. But what we want to do, if we're going to use the Bruce Lee idea of using no way is way, we want to have as many ways that we've experienced as possible. We want to open up the toolbox, if you will. So then that way, potentially abundance of strategies, of tools, of weapons, or uh, however we want to think about that, of potential actions could precede our ability to adapt. And I think it's there first and foremost that the performer needs to open up the abundance of their toolbox and then begin to 
explore the various ways of interacting so they can find the more biomechanically sound or efficient or effective ways. The way that most trainers and coaches, which I think is a mistake, they kind of have it backwards to that, is they try to arm the individual with the one way, the best way of acting, right? Because we are going to uh, advocate for some sort of technical model first and foremost, and then we'll get to, to opening up the bandwidth. But I would prefer that we open up that bandwidth first and allow them to have more tools in their toolbox, more weapons, if you will, of choice, so then they can start to explore the use of it, the coordination of it, the way that they might be paired together. When I say they, those actions be paired together. So when the problem asks something of the performer or of the police officer in this case, they have a plethora of potential strategies to draw from. And it's there then I feel as though that we find what's optimal for that authentic individual. Again, Bruce Lee said to honestly and authentically express oneself. Now, a police officer might think to themselves, well, I'm not honestly and authentically expressing myself. I'm just trying to keep myself from getting killed and detain the individual in some of these cases, right? However, it is still this honest, authentic expression. How you behave after 30 years of law enforcement is going to differ very much from the person who's just fresh out of the academy. And what we want to do is you want to equip them so they can explore different ways of acting, try to find their authenticity, but maybe nudge them into potential ways of acting. But it isn't just potential ways of acting, Chris. It's what information in the world they might be able to perceive. Jacobs and Michaels in the theory of direct learning called this the education of attention. Nudging them to what to look for, but maybe not telling them exactly what to see. If that makes some sense. Like it, it seems sort of like an oxymoron to a certain degree, but you want them to explore it for themselves. You want them to see it because once they see it, they can't unsee it, if you will. It's like being in this state of fog, but you have fog lamps on because you know what to look for or maybe how to explore the fog to see the potential path or way forward. Jacobs and Michaels also talked about this education of intention which is our intentional aims to act in a given way in a certain situation. Notice what we did there. We talked about how it isn't just about the biomechanical motor actions any longer. It's in how and why and what emerged from what information we picked up and detected in the world and what decisions we might have made based on that information. And is that, so that's extremely helpful. And I'm thinking as you're talking in your paper, you spoke about this idea that Bruce Lee embodied, and that is one of representativeness and the importance of representativeness. So is that is that a critical aspect of what you just spoke about? So if our goal as law enforcement trainers is to, to nudge police officers in trainings towards this uh, acquisition of adaptive decision-making is, is representativeness of the criterion environment absolutely critical for developing that game intelligence then? Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. And one idea that we really wanted to allow it to uh, maybe hit home for readers of the paper was what Bruce Lee talked about um, the environment and its problems being alive. He talked about alive problems where there's a resisting opponent, there's unpredictability present, uh, one has to truly make decisions on the fly in an online fashion, but they also have to perceive information about the opportunities and challenges in the moment. And so Bruce Lee often talked about, well, I mean, there's a quote in one of his movies where he says, boards don't hit back. You know, it just like I say with agility ladders, like an agility tackle ladder never tackled anybody right like it's one of those things where we have to look to represent that as much as we possibly can 
Now, I know law enforcement trainers are going to say, well, we might not be able to have live bullets firing back at us uh, in order to train the police academy student to get more accustomed to the, the real threat, to feel pressure and anxiety or to to do it in some of these fatigued states nearly to the same degree as they will when they're out in the field. And I get that. We, If we always pushed a learner to that point or place where they were stretched to their challenge point, where they didn't have a grip over their solution space in relation to that problem, they're probably not going to learn very well because they're always going to be flooded by too much information, too much complexity, too much intensity. But what we want to do with representative that we can find some things that police and law enforcement trainers really can do uh, to turn the volume up on their learning environments and to bring a little bit more of that chaos and complexity that we know certainly is going to be magnified. It's going to intensify really quickly when one is on a call. Like, yeah, it could be a routine traffic stop where you're just pulling somebody over, or it could be something dramatically different. And if you think about how most people probably train it, it's not very representativeness. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of representativeness to the real world. Because they're, well, we're going to work on this today. So now the learner walks in, they kind of know how it is that they're supposed to behave and act, and they know what they're working on. But the field isn't going to ask that of them, right? The field is going to tell them that, yeah, one of these traffic stops might be routine, and the other one, someone might pull a weapon on you. And if you aren't really connecting to the information in the world, that problem isn't very alive or representative then in that way. Again, behavior affords behavior as the, the Bruce Lee quote, the highest technique is to have no technique. My movement is a result of your movement. That's the thing that we want to think about. The police officer's behaviors are a result of what's unfolding in the environment. And so we want to look to represent that wherever, whenever, and however possible. And that representativeness, I think if I'm hearing you correctly, Sean, like it, that contextualization is that, would that be an, uh, an, another similar term for that, like contextualizing your training. And so if we think about what the criterion environment might look like for those officers out on the street, even if that's just going from a simple escort position to somebody who suddenly opposes that and offers resistance, and you have to sense that and, and adapt to that like contextualizing that in training the that representativeness that should that should start early on in the acquisition of skills because as you said earlier i think the focus often is well we're going to we're going to work on this linear skill and then when you get to a certain level of performance at that skill then then we will start to add on some representativeness but that's not the approach is it no i think it should be alive right from jump street like right from the get-go, I think we should look to have the immersion into a more alive and unpredictable, more representative environment much, much, much earlier on. And I think it's there that one learns or acquires or begins to adapt their skill based on this mutual reciprocal exchange with an environment, as opposed to the other way around where they're going to go acquire some skill that actually isn't contextualized at all. It was not connected to what was unfolding in the world. And then we almost have to start over again anyway. And, you know, people will bring up examples, say, such as um, learning to dribble a basketball to not do it with a, an opponent or hitting a baseball off of a tee. Well, I was really great at tee ball, but I sucked when there was a pitcher in front of me, I would strike out repeatedly. I despised baseball because of it. Like I was fine if the ball was sitting there stationary on the tee because I went back in the backyard and I, my siblings were much, much older than me. My next closest sibling is 13 years older than me. So I, I didn't have anyone to play with. I lived out in the country, but I would put a ball on a tee and swing and swing and swing. 
And I thought I was becoming a better baseball player. Well, when it became time to actually go play baseball out on the diamond and my parents dropped me off, I literally struck out every single time uh, because I had no ability to connect to that information. And my swing that I had worked on and what I thought, at least as an eight-year-old, perfected based on my T swinging was no longer there and no longer present. And I think it's it, it's that concept that we kind of have to think about. It's the same thing when we think about learning to drive. I think we could make much more skillful drivers if we change the way that people drove. Now, again, I understand there's risk there. there there's always going to be a certain inherent level of risk, just as there is out in the world. And we're looking to scale the information or scale the aliveness or turn down the volume of the representative nature of it. So I'm not suggesting, again, we just throw them out to the wolves and let them fend for themselves in chaos and complexity. But there are ways to turn down the volume enough so it meets that learner where they're at, where they currently stand and who they currently are with their skill. Right. Okay. And is that where... So this idea of the constraints-led approach is a helpful construct for trainers. Like, would you recommend that as we move towards the ecological dynamic world of skill acquisition in law enforcement, that we, alongside of that, we use that constraints-led approach to as a framework to help us do exactly what you just said, add the contextualization, the representativeness, but do it in a strategic way that we don't overwhelm and because we don't want to crush our students with too much representativeness. So there, how do, how do we understand that sweet spot for optimal learning? Yeah. And that's sort of the magic question, right? How do we know the sweet spot? Because the sweet spot is going to be highly nonlinear, meaning it's going to be different performer to performer, but it's also going to be different day to day for the performer, maybe rep to rep for the performer because of who it is that they are in that moment. Maybe, maybe pressure and anxiety is getting to them a bit. Maybe they are getting more fatigued throughout the day or throughout the shift, say, for example. And the way that they are interacting now might not be how they would have interacted yesterday or the way that they'll interact even on the next rep or tomorrow. So that certainly is part of the art of being a coach or a trainer or a facilitator in this way. But the constraints-led approach in the constraints model, uh, initially proposed by Carl Newell and then reconceptualized a bit more by Keith Davids and colleagues, this constraints-led approach really where one is trying to manipulate constraints to bring that learner to their challenge point. It requires the facilitator to be very attuned and very sensitive themselves, just as the performer is. Meaning you as a facilitator have to be trying to read and recognize and make sense of what is unfolding in front of your very eyes. And then that allows you to manipulate certain aspects of the task or the environment, or maybe even of the organism or the performer, right? Changing their intention slightly. Maybe something along the lines of the equipment that they're wearing. Maybe it's something like the environment that they're in and uh, the weather conditions or the ambient light that's available. Like all of these things that we know are going to be the realities of law enforcement. I just am not sure how many law enforcement agencies are covering all these bases and thinking about bringing more repetition without repetition. Again, no two problems are ever the same, neither are any two solutions. And we must allow that person, that adaptive learner, to continue to adapt their skill in that way. Again, right off the bat, right from Jump Street. And the way that we can do that is through the manipulation of those respective constraints, task, environmental, and organism or human. Perfect. Great. And so... We're, uh, we're, we're coming up quickly on an hour. That was, so, that was quick. Yeah, that you know, was, quick. I know it's super quick, but great info. And I want to go back to, uh, Bruce Lee's, uh, framework here in your paper, Sean. And I, I know, and I've listened to previous podcasts cause I always like to listen to podcasts with guests. I'm going to have on to go, okay, uh, how's, how's this individual, uh, approach things. And I've heard you say that one of the things you appreciate the most about podcasts is a difficult question that you weren't expecting. That, that is true. 
because that's <laughs> ecological and that's alive and here you go. So I'd like to know from you, I want to give you a few minutes to say if you if you had the ear of law enforcement trainers and thinking about Bruce Lee's approach, can you give us some bullet points? Like what would you encourage law enforcement trainers to do to move from a traditional linear world into the world of ecological dynamics? Yeah, and and obviously this is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where practical and applicable use of of some information obviously hopefully transcends itself from my very weird peculiar environment hopefully into your very weird and peculiar environment and environments right um because at least in my world we know that the football field is 100 yards long 53 and a third well why did that part is never going to change even if the weather conditions might whereas your world changes and changes dramatically and and because of that I am going to use and drop a couple of Bruce Lee nuggets. So I'm going to borrow and steal from Bruce Lee here. The first thing I would say before I offer this answer is the the Bruce Lee quote that I try to include in almost every continuing education type of opportunity or exchange that I have with somebody, which is to use your own experience, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, because some of what I'm about to say might be bullshit to you in the police environment or even the officer themselves, and then add what is uniquely your own. I say all that to say this, Chris, is I think Bruce Lee's idea that encompasses Jeet Kune Do, which is to use no way as way, needs to be this springboard for skill acquisition everywhere. To use no way as the way and so that means i believe that we should try to abandon or think outside of the box of that which what has traditionally been taught decade after decade year after year and teacher to to student and then being passed down over and over again i think we have to start thinking about other ways of being able to be functional practical useful or successful out in the real world and if we were to do that, it doesn't matter if it's an American football field or the field that your law enforcement students are going to have to go behave in and protect the rest of our communities through. It doesn't matter where that environment is or anything in between. It could just be the common person walking down the street. If we don't use the way, maybe from that which what someone else has told us or or some certain path. Now, I'm not saying that we want to abandon anything that's been successful. That is a potential way, but it might not be the way for every performer in every situation. And so I think it's there if we can just, if there's one thing that those that are listening might take from what I'm saying today, it's to explore more ways of doing anything. It could be apprehending and, and, and someone or, or interacting with them and being sensitive to them and their time of need relating to them as, I, I mean, you guys have one of the very toughest jobs, if not the toughest job on the planet, right? Like you got to be so many different things, so chameleon-like moment to moment. And for that, I don't envy you, but like think about any and everything that you could be at any given day and just realize that finding your way should and could be a very authentic process it's not only about that execution but it's in that process of learning and in that process of growing and in that process of evolving too just because something worked for someone else doesn't mean that it's the best way or path for you and so i know that um, I love the challenging question. I love the hard question. And it was a great one. Hopefully my answer made some semblance of sense. Um, but I think it's one that we could all really try to learn from. It's why, you know, when we look at interacting with the world and each of us finding our way, there's 8 billion people on the planet or however many we have now, we're all going to find our different way, even though we all live on the same earth. Absolutely. That, no, that's incredibly helpful, Sean. Thank you for that. And do you have 
So let's say a law enforcement trainer listening to this is really interested in wanting to find out more about ecological dynamics, about the constraints-led approach. Where would be the point of entry for them? I mean, obviously reading your paper here would be a great start, uh, but where would you then say, like, here's an approach that you would give advice to on how to get into this framework? Yeah, I would certainly point people to the paper and within the paper, um, again, kind of adopting that Bruce Lee idea. Everybody's experience is going to be a little different. So use your own experience and attempt to absorb, reject, and add accordingly as you go through this interactive process. But then look to some of the references that we might have supplied within there, whether it's Bruce Lee or ecological dynamics related. And of course, in the ecological dynamic space, one of my co-authors is the four founding or one of the four founding fathers of ecological dynamics, if you will, in Keith Davids, who's obviously absolutely brilliant and has been a huge influence to me and my craft. Uh, so I would suggest just exploring wherever anyone's entry point is on some of those things. And one of the things that we've certainly have done or tried to do at Emergence is put together resources that would allow someone to maybe find their entry point also. So if they check out Emergence and some of the things that we're doing, it's at Emergent movement mvmt.com so i know it's kind of a weird url the tv show emergence was coming out at the same time and somehow abc took precedence over our little llc so uh, go um, figure <laughs> yeah so if anyone wants to check us out what we're doing we have blog posts that if somebody isn't looking to maybe purchase a course or or interact with us on a live experience interact with the blog posts they are meant to meet people where they are across a wide range of skill levels, knowledge levels, interest levels even. And just start to explore and meditate upon some of those ideas as you interact with them. Okay, that's fantastic. And and I will echo that. Uh, I've benefited already from the training that you do provide at Emergence. And I've taken the, I think it's ecological dynamics for dummies, which was appropriate because that's how <laughs> that's how I felt listening to you to you guys talk. But in fairness, it was a very well done uh, module, and I I would encourage our students or our listeners if they're interested in ecological dynamics to go to the website at Emergent Movement and look at that. And and you've got then after that you've got a series of more. Uh, going deeper, we would say, into the world of ecological dynamics as well. So I'm excited to avail myself of that opportunity as well. So, uh, Sean, anything that you want to say in closing, brother? Is there anything you wished I would have asked you that I didn't or a word that you want to leave with our law enforcement training audience? No, I, I like I said earlier, when we were at uh, 10 minutes ago or so, this this time together went by exceptionally quick. Uh, it went by very, very quickly, and it was because of this mutual reciprocal exchange that you and I had. Uh, obviously, it's all about the passion and the energy um, that you bring to the table, that you bring to your craft. And I just, in a parting word, I certainly want to give my gratitude to all of the law enforcement trainers and police officers, law enforcement professionals across the board, because obviously all of us as civilians owe you a debt of gratitude. And I just uh, obviously am very appreciative that someone like yourself uh, has been influenced in any way, shape, or form by any of the work or thoughts or ideas that I've ruminated about or put out to the world. And anyone else that is listening out there, uh, I, I, my thank you goes to you as opposed to the opposite way around. Well, that heartfelt thanks, I know, will be very meaningful to our law enforcement officers who have are feeling a little beaten up and bruised and bloodied after the last few years of attacks, both on the inside and the outside. So yeah, thank I you so it. Thank you so much for that, Sean. And thank you for taking the time. More importantly, thank you for what you and your colleagues do at Emergent. And uh, we look forward to even more amazing things coming out uh, from you. Thank you, my friend.